the purpose of this video today is to help those who are looking to get initiated or those who are curious about it and you're not sure and those who aren't initiated however you may be doing these things and not realize they're actually wrong and this video is coming to you guys today I made mistakes in the years and months approaching to my initiation and I'm fully initiated into the Afro-Cuban religion Lukumi I'm what they call an apathibi hey lovers Chantal Anastasia here back with another video ooh, ooh. all right if you're new what it do and if you've been here a while welcome back so this video was coming to you guys because I've seen a lot of people make the mistakes I did and it's unfortunate because there's no one there to correct them in a way that is constructive, right? I believe in constructive criticism and not just finger pointing and putting someone else down and belittling them, almost bullying them. It's not right. And I was bullied, right? Not everyone in the religion is a bully there are beautiful people in the religion that I am very fond of and I look up to however there are some individuals that, that will look for confrontation if you do something wrong and you are not initiated I believe that everyone needs to watch this video prior to being initiated or if you're uninitiated but you do love the religion and you want to learn more about it watch this video Okay, lovelies, we're going to take a quick 10-second break, stretch, have a sip of water, and I look forward to you seeing what's up next. In today's video, I'm going to be deep diving on the do's and the don'ts prior to being initiated into an African tradition religion such as Santeria, Ifa, Isheshe, Lukumi. What I'm going to do is break this video up into two sections. I'm first going to take you guys down the road of things that you should not do. And then we're going to touch on things that you should do that I highly recommend. So let's get this bad boy started. African tradition religions are a closed practice. However, it's gained a lot of popularity after Beyonce put out one of her music videos in, I believe, 2018. One of the visuals we see in Beyonce's Blackest King is her depiction of Yemoya. Yemoya is a river deity, her color is blue, and she's associated with the ocean because of her relationship with Oluku. In this video, I strongly feel that this was a depiction of Eshu Alegua. Now, let's clarify a few things. Eshu is not Satan. Eshu was not born, he is the absence of light, and Aludomare is light, and they learn how to coexist. Eshu Alegua is represented by the colors red and black, and Ilegua is the only person who can calm Eshu. Next, we have Babalue. He is actually a merciful Orisha, however, he is feared, and you don't want to get on his bad side. Babalue is a muscular man who covers himself with straw and walks with the help of a staff. He can cure you as quickly as he can make you contract a disease. He can make any person sick as a punishment, which is why he is so feared. However, he can cure that person, which is why he is so respected. Next is Oya. She is a force of change in nature and represented by the winds, and her color is purple. She is a very fierce warrior Orisha, and even Shango is sometimes frightened by her power. Next, we have the Orisha Oshun. She is represented by the color yellow. She represents sweetness, love, beauty, and is a river deity. Oya and Oshun, sisters here. This seed of black is king is powerful because it talks about the reverence of our elders. This elder here is a South African actress by the name Mary Twala. And I love this scene because it just shows the power of our elders and those who came before us. Okay, lovelies, we're going to take a quick 10-second break, stretch, have a sip of water, and I look forward to you seeing what's up next. Princess Nokia, she made a music video that embodied Yemoya. In the beginning of her music video, Bruja, she starts off with the song of Yemoya, and it goes like this. Kai, 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 Yemoya Oloto, kai, 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 Asisu Oloto. Kai kai kai, yemaya oloto. 
kai 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 ase su oloto lario ke lario ke lario ke lario ke yamaya oloto awaloto mio yamaya oloto awaloto mio yamaya oloto awaloto mio yamaya oloto awalo tomio and because it's being seen in mainstream media of course it's going to pick up wind and it's going to get the curiosity of a lot of people especially millennials and gen z so this video is essential because i do not want anyone to go through what i went through i was super over ambitious and i got ahead of myself and i have a big following on TikTok. I have about 210k, right? And with me talking about the religion and like posting stuff and making videos, I was reprimanded by someone who was an initiated priest. Now, the way he spoke to me is not the way a priest would actually speak to someone. Unfortunately, he was of that lower vibration he's what they would call like an ifa bully and my padrino actually has an awesome video on this and how detrimental it can be to people who were very interested in religion and wanted to learn and it was hurtful because i meant no harm i was eager to learn i knew it was my calling i felt it on the soul level and i got a, i got ahead of myself and instead of this guy coming from a place of understanding and maybe doing a little bit research on me, he attacked. And I had a knee-jerk reaction and I responded. And it just became a big thing. He went on Instagram about it, dragged other people who were initiated, and it just felt like I was being ganged up on. And had I had a reliable source on what to do and what not to do when it comes to African tradition religions, I know I could have avoided it. So today, this is why I'm making this video so people do not have to go through what I went to because it actually slowed down my learning process. I probably took about three months off. I'm not going to lie. I was in public and I was just reading the comments and I cried because it's like, imagine you finding your you know, getting closer to finding your purpose and your destiny and finally finding a faith that makes sense to you and then people inside of it attacking you. And it's just like, what? Like, this is, I felt like it's it's in my blood, it's in my veins. I just haven't made it official yet. I haven't gone through the process to make it official. So it was hurtful and I took some time off. I was just like, whoa. And I rethought, like, is this really what I want to do? And... I finally came to my senses. I was like, no, I cannot have other people stop me from where I'm meant to be, from me fulfilling my destiny. And I pushed forward, and I learned from my mistakes. I only have to touch that hot stove once to know it's hot. I learned my lesson, and I moved a hell of a lot slower, took my time, didn't rush, stayed in my place, and taught and studied what I knew was correct, and it set me up for success because when I found a padrino who was really learning to teach me and to help me, and he was a babaleao, and I knew that through him, I can then become initiated. It was it was a beautiful, it took me about six or seven months to get initiated, meaning there was a waiting period after I paid my dues. And in that time, it was beautiful because I felt... <sighs> I felt safe. I felt safe. And that is one of the foundations you need prior to getting involved in this getting involved in this religion. All right? So, section 1, I'm going to go through eight don'ts, all right? The biggest no-no is number 1 is honoring the Rishas, learning about the Rishas, and completely neglecting your Egun, who are your ancestors, your spirit guides, and your bloodline. These are the people who, if it was not for them, you would not be here. The Rishas are great, but honestly, the Rishas will not help you if you're neglecting your own Egun, your ancestors, your bloodline, your spirit guides that are around you. 
Initiations do not substitute honoring your ancestors and spirit guides. Communication with one's Egun, one's bloodline, and spirit guides are the foundation in the Lukumi faith, even in the Isheshe faith, even in Santeria, and I'm sure in Voodoo. So before you get ahead of yourself, you need to make yourself an ancestor altar. And you know what? I'm actually going to touch on this in the do's. But do not go honoring and learning about the Orishas if you don't even know the people who brought you here. Okay? Because they're not going to be too happy. And you know what's going to happen? While you're learning and while you're getting ready to initiate, if that's what you want to do, they're going to make themselves known. And you may see blockages because they're like, hold on, hold on, what is she doing? What is she doing? <laughs> Can you imagine your great-great-grandma in the corner like, oh, she want to initiate, but she don't want to leave me out any food or water or light a candle? Chuh. <laughs> Caribbeans, we say chuh. I don't know what that, it's like a, it's. I don't even know how to explain it, but if you're West Indian, you know what cha means. It's not a good thing. Someone goes cha. All right. Okay, lovelies, we're going to take a quick 10 second break, stretch, have a sip of water, and I look forward to you seeing what's up next. Number two. Ooh, okay. These babies are called the Lekes, right? And a person will receive them based on how their initiation ceremony goes. So these, this that I have right now, this is my mano de arula, and I have the bracelet, which is called an ile. I'm giving this by my baba layout, as well as the bracelet. I see a lot of people wearing a whole bunch of alekes, which are all the warriors, so they may have shango, yemoya, ilegua, They'll have Ogun, Ochosi, all these Alekes, but they haven't even gone through the ceremony. And this is a mistake I made. I was overly ambitious, and unfortunately, because I was overly ambitious, I had on blinders. I was so focused on the outcome, I was not listening to my grandmother. You know, God bless her soul. I have a picture of her. This is my granny. She was Ifa. I remember she had a sopera in her home, so I do believe, and my babalaos, in my ile, do believe that she was either a child of Olukun or a child of Yemoya. And she was speaking to me, but I was not listening because I just wanted to be initiated. I was not looking at the signs that the person that was supposed to be initiating me and helping me did not have my best interest in mind. And I was told that it was okay to wear my leckes prior to my ceremony. And that is wrong. Imagine you rocking a sorority or a fraternity jacket. And you have never been initiated into it. And you go on campus. Or you're posting videos online and you're wearing it. How do you think those people are going to feel who went through the blood, sweat, tears, sacrifice, studying? everything to wear that jacket with pride wear those letters wear those colors with pride imagine how they would feel that's exactly how people feel in the religion it may not be that deep for some people however we do sacrifice a lot it's a lot of time it's a lot of money it's a lot of learning it's a lot of patience. It's a lot. I am literally back in school. I feel like I'm getting my master's. And no joke, I'm going to show you guys how serious I'm taking it. This is my binder, right? <laughs> this is what they use for the Ifa divination. I love it. It reminds me of the astrological chart, and which is also a spiritual science. And Ifa is a spiritual science. So I'm trying to find the correlation. But something drew me to this. I put this on my binder. However... My padrino sends me texts. He sends me documents to study, right? It's all stuff to study, to read, highlighted, and I have it all in this binder and it's organized, right? How to tend my warriors, and I am back in school. It's a lot of work. I try to study at least once or twice a week. So imagine someone just rocking all these alekes and then have to do any of the work, but they're just carrying that badge. That's a no-no. At the end of the day, if you're just buying them off of Amazon or buying it off of Etsy or going to the Botanica and wearing it, 
they're literally pieces of jewelry. They have no ashe to them because these elekes and this ile that I received has gone through consecration and ceremony, right? It has been activated. So next thing, woo, shrines and altars. All right, so to clarify, your altar is going to be for your egun, for your ancestors. You'll have an ancestor altar, or we call a bovida in Latin America, right? Or you may have a working altar where you may do, if, you do, if you're a witch, if you're a bruja, you may do your crafts on that working altar, right? And then they will have, a, you are a spiritist of misas, you'll have an altar, right? Where you're able to... Um, uh, tap into espiritismo, right? And that's a whole nother, like, faith. Now, the Rishas do go on altars. <laughs> the Rishas go on something called shrines. And a true Arisha shrine is not just a statue and a candle and some fruit. It's not that at all. Here we have a beautiful shrine for Oshun. Yemoya, look at those blue flowers. This is a shrine for Baba Lue, and he's represented by St. Lazarus in Santeria. And this is a gorgeous shrine for Oya. Shrines are massive, and they also go through consecration. So you'll see like soperas, they're huge. A shrine for an Orisha can literally take up a whole wall. I've seen very big and elaborate ones, and it's beautiful. It holds a lot of ashe, right? So... That little nightstand you have with the Oshun statue and some fruit and some honey and whatnot, it's nothing. You might as well just, I suggest just take it down because guess what? I did the same thing two years ago. 2020, I made up my mind that Lukum, well, first I found Santeria, that Santeria is where I wanted to be. And I dive deep into the Rishas. I set up a shrine for Oshun. And, well, it was an altar at the time because I thought the name was Altar. And through my own studies and really investigating, I was like, ooh, this isn't right. And then someone actually called me out on it after I already took it down because I had it posted in some old, old content from two years ago. Someone went through. One of those people, that, that guy from TikTok, was talking to they went through my Instagram and they saw the shrine they saw the altar I had and they chewed me out for that it was so old so I had to take the time and go through my Instagram and delete so much from my business page because I was misinformed <laughs> I was so misinformed however I learned I knew and I started from scratch right and even my photos with my leques that had those leques on I probably did three or four videos I didn't care how many likes views I had I took it down because I was embarrassed. I'm not going to lie. I was embarrassed because I'm like, damn, I got ahead of myself. And I felt, I felt a little stupid because I know better, right? But that's why I believe we're so excited as black and Latino and Caribbean women to find our roots that we can get too far ahead. Do I think it's the worst thing in the world? No, because if you're doing it with good intention, it's under it's understandable. It's people who are doing it with bad intentions or for self or for ego or for clout where it's not good. But a lot of, I've seen a lot of women are just very eager to finally find the root of who they are, who, their lineage, you know, where their ancestors started. So I understand because I've been there, done that. Okay, lovelies, we're going to take a quick 10-second break, stretch, have a sip of water, and I look forward to you seeing what's up next. Next thing. Let me get this tea. Woo! Next thing I'm going to touch on is working with the Arishas. All right. If you are a non-initiate, you should not be working with the Arishas. And... To be honest, when you are initiated into an ATR, receiving that hand of Ifa, that mano de arula, it puts a mark on your head. And the Orishas know if you've been initiated or not. So you can think that, oh, Alegua, 
He loves me. He comes down. He talks to me. Everyone sees him around me. You need to stop. Stop at five. Because it doesn't work that way, right? There's a lot of ceremony, a lot of tradition, a lot of things that take place for something of that sort to even happen. And to be honest, as far as my knowledge goes and my studies, I'm not sure it even works that way. I don't know if he just comes down like that. <laughs> um, maybe Archangel Michael in <laughs> Catholicism, but I don't know. So it's not smart to be working with the Orishas. And one good thing I see, I wanted to take this out because I was corrected on it. Ooh, I got to clean this. Ooh, ooh, we're going to put this. This just goes to show. Hold on. Because of this, I need to clean my hands. Oh, boy. All right. So one thing you'll see a lot of people have, and I'm holding it in this plastic because I put it away and it got some mold and what on it. But the Allegua stone, right? Eshu Allegua. A lot of people now have these and they put it by their door. And, you know, they're doing his Ebo. Ebo is offerings, attending the, uh, attending the warrior. A lot of people are doing these, you know, on Mondays and whatnot, which is great. It's great to see the intention there. However, you should not be messing with it, especially that Eshu Alegua. And I was corrected by my padrino. As soon as I took a picture and I showed him, he was like, no, put that away. I unpacked everything, put it in a bag, and I'm now taking it out. And you see it's, there's a lot of stuff on it. That's why I had it in the plastic. But he was like, no. It can actually mess up your life by doing that because you're tapping into an energy that you know nothing about. It's basically trying to put a password into a computer that you really don't have access to, but you're just trying different passwords. You're probably going to get bounced out and alerted. Everyone's going to be alerted that someone's trying to get in, right? So don't do that. It's not very smart. Honor your ancestors. <laughs> it is the most simplest thing you can do. And if you think that you're working with the Arisha because you're going through a lot and, you know, only they can help you, no. Your ancestors, that's your first line of defense. They're up there fighting battles for you in the spiritual realm, and sometimes you will never know because it doesn't even manifest here on the physical plane. They already fought it. So honestly, if you're going through hard times and you you need help from a higher source, ain't nothing like a white candle, a glass of water, and some prayer. Honestly, that can take you very far. If you want to petition an Orisha by lighting a specific candle, that's perfectly fine. So, for example, I have here my Yemoya candle, one of my best sellers. And I love lighting it because my Ori is Olukun, and she's actually very, very close with Yemoya. So, they both share the sea. Yemoya rules the top of the sea, whereas Olukun is the entire sea. She rules all the bodies of water, right? So, petitioning Orisha is perfectly fine. Think of petitioning the Orisha as, you know, being vegan is healthy. And you know what? For one week, you're going to go to a vegan restaurant and eat vegan and have vegan takeout and cook vegan food. And then that's it. It doesn't make you vegan. No, you just were vegan for that week. You were utilizing what veganism can give you in that point in time. And then you went about your business, right? But if you decided to keep going then and be a vegan, then not fall into you taking the steps to become initiated. Cool? Cool. Number five, claiming an Orisha as your guardian Orisha, as your Ori. This is a no-no because honestly, you there's people who are doing tarot now to find out your Ori. There's YouTube videos that you can watch that give you the characteristics of children of a certain Orisha. And then there's people who do you know, divinations, like you can get an Ifa reading, right? And they'll give you a certain Odu, and a certain Orisha may come to surface the reading. However, that does not mean that's your guardian Orisha. Only through ceremony, and there's a lot of protocols that take place during that moment when they're bringing your Orisha down, 
right? That your guardian Risha will come forward. It will not be like you're going to know before. You may be aligned with them, intuitive, and you may have an idea who they are. However, don't claim it. Because it's like, I'm going to say another metaphor, because I love talking in metaphors. It's like claiming a set you don't belong to and posting stuff online, and you don't even belong to that set. And if you know what I mean by set, good. If you don't know what I mean, eh, don't worry about it. I'm from Brooklyn, so, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, you're not going to claim something, claim some set you don't belong to. Like, you crazy? Don't do that. Wait till you go through the initiation. Then claim it. But don't do that. So, yes. And it's funny. If I had a dollar for every time someone was like, oh, I'm a child of Oshun. Man, listen. <laughs> not everyone in the cat down the road is a child of Oshun, okay? I was told... I had a reading done. They told me I'm a child of Obatala. And I'm like, alright, cool. I got the wisdom. But I'm like, I'm not calm. I have a temper. And I'm not patient. And there was some discrepancies. Sorry. And I'm not patient. And there were some discrepancies. But I went along with it and I claimed it online. And then I stopped. I stopped. Because it just... It just didn't feel right, and I'm like, I'm going to feel stupid, because I learned that you really find out during ceremony. I was like, I'm going to feel stupid if this isn't my Arisha, because now I'm seeing something isn't adding up, me and this Arisha, so yeah. And then come to find out, during my ceremony, guess who comes forward? Olukun. And I was like, eh. And I actually knew prior to my ceremony, yes, some Arishas can come to you in dreams, I was very certain it's not it's always a shot in the dark not everyone can guess and be correct however it was six years of this religion being brought to me and me doing the work to get here and I sat and I write down every time I have a reading with someone I write it down and I've only in this last six years I've only been read by four people I don't get read by everybody and I read all the notes, and I just reflected, and I chose Olokun. I was like, all right, I believe Olokun is my gardener, Risha. I hope she is, because just through her patakis, which are legends in the Yoruba religion, through just learning of her archetype, and, and even my own grandma, like what she had me doing, traditions we were doing as a child, I was like, I really, really believe it's Olukun, and I was right, and I was so happy, because it means that I'm, I was very much aligned, and that those six years were not in vain. All right, so number six, woo, mixing Lukumi, Isheshe, uh, Santeria with other practices, such as hoodoo, paganism, Wicca, that is a no-no. That is like oil and vinegar. That is a no-no. You can't mix a religion with another practice. It's, it's, it's taboo. It's not traditional. And it can be frowned upon by a lot of people. Did I make that mistake? Oh, yes. I made them that is more associated with hoodoo, a mojo bag, and I assigned it to a specific orisha that was aligned with wealth. And I didn't know better. And I got chewed out. And that's what that guy on TikTok chewed me out for. It wasn't like I made a huge mistake. It was just that that one item was not correct. And I corrected myself. I removed Ajay from it. And I called it what it was. A money mojo bag. I did not know. I did not know. At the end of the day, I was using my creativity. And I was just putting my Ajay into it. And I just felt so confident in it. I did not know. So... Don't do this. You know, Lokumi is Lokumi. Isheshe is Isheshe. Santeria is Santeria. Voodoo is Voodoo. Hoodoo is Hoodoo. And so on and so on. Woo! All right. Number seven is a hot topic. Because I see it a lot on YouTube specifically. And I cringe. Because now that I'm initiated... Hearing some of these stories or hearing people teach about the religion when they're not initiated, it's like, ee. And if anything, you look silly. You look silly. 
And another thing, you're leading people, you're miseducating people, which isn't good, right? So you should not be teaching about the religion if you are not initiated in the religion. And even with me, I at this point, at this rank, I won't teach about any Orishas because I still need to learn about it. And then there's things that I can speak about and cannot speak about. So I also need to remain in my place, right? So, yes, I'm a free spirit. You know, I go with the flow. But when I'm serious, I mean fucking business, right? So I take my religion very seriously. You saw my binder. I have a list of things I can and cannot do. I made promises to my padrino, to my, to my ile. And I'm going to adhere to it. At the end of the day, everyone has free will. And if they want to teach a religion from the outside in, that's their prerogative. It is what it is. But imagine someone teaching about African American or Caribbean, Latina, Latino, uh, Native American, or Taino culture and tradition. But they're not even part of that race. They're a totally different race. And it's like, where are you getting this information from? Oh, another source. But where do they get that information from? So it becomes telephone in a sense. So I would just hold off. I was reprimanded. Luckily, not on a Broadway. I had, a, I had an associate that she was already initiated. And she's been initiated for some time. And she, you know, we had a reading. We had a call, a very long call. And she was like, look, you know... I understand you're eager and you love the religion, but just hold off on teaching the religion because it can cause problems. It can put a target on your back from other people who are in the religion and you're saying the wrong things. And it's true. So, mm, threw it away. I stopped teaching. I even deleted some stuff and I taught what I know, which is herbs, roots, oils, plants, healing, Ayurveda medicine, meditation, shadow work. There's so many of the things that I was more of an expert on because I've been studying it for who knows how long, for like six years. I even have certifications in certain things. So I went back to that, right? I went back to what I knew and what I was studying and what I'm certified in. Number eight. So this question actually comes from one of my clients from the Urban Garvey Mama shop. Donna Eagle asked me about my suggestions on what I would recommend as to start the journey in terms of reading or research materials and that's a great question so one I'm gonna say hold off on buying books in regards to African spirituality and African religions and whatnot wait till you are initiated and then speak to your spiritual elder, your padrino, the babalaos, people in your ile, on what to buy. Because they will know what's fugazi and what's true. And you don't want to waste your money on buying a book that's completely just whew, talking about apples when you should be talking about oranges, right? And did I buy books? Of course I bought books. You want to see all the books I bought? Because I did not know any better. Here we go. These are some books that I bought. If I had to total... All this, I'd say it's about $150, $170 I spent. And one of these books turns out it may be Fugazi and it's the most expensive. It cost me $70. And the two other ones, I don't know yet. I have to run them past my padrino to find out. However, one book I do recommend for you guys is this book. Run for it. So this book is stories of slaves that fought for their freedom. It is not super long, but there's pictures. And the reason I'm running, um, the reason that I'm reading it is because I want to remember why I'm bettering my ancestors. I want to see what they went through so that when I'm venerating them, it's coming even more from my heart, right? Because this heart center, when it comes to Lukumi, this heart center is powerful. Everything you do from your heart in the religion, you'll see in tenfold, right? Whether it is attending to your warriors, what is it, whether it's attending to Ifa, who is who they say is Arumila, whether it is, you know, learning, whether it's doing an Igbo, whatever. Whatever you do from that heart, you'll see. And in our religion, one of the... I'm not sure if it's a principle. It may be. We do have 16 principles to abide by that Arumila 
gave to us and it's based on how people behave in heaven and one of them is good character right and not gossiping and there's a lot of it it, it really this religion changes you in a sense it makes you mindful of the little things you do that are detrimental to your own growth and to other people's growth why do you need to gossip and it's true like you can kind of fall into that so gossip something I don't take part in anymore and another thing is good character by you know putting your best foot forward doing the right thing even when no one is watching so if there's a book I do recommend, it is Run From It, and the author is Marcelio Di Celete. And I got this off of Amazon, it was about 25 bucks. I am going to make another video of books I would recommend after I have speak to my padrino, so I will definitely tune back for that video, alright? Alright, so let's get into the do's. Okay, lovelies, we're going to take a quick 10-second break, stretch, have a sip of water, and I look forward to you seeing what's up next. Now we're about to get a little fun, all right? You guys know the don'ts? Now let's get into the do's. One, if you are looking uh, for a house, an ile, a babalao, an ayanifa, Basically someone who can set you up for success for initiation or just learn and talk to go to religious events that are being hosted by your local botanica. And guess what? If you don't have a local botanica that holds religious events, you're going to have to buy that plane ticket. You're going to have to get that Airbnb and do the work. Because if you are serious about taking part in this religion, this community, and putting in the hard work and the steps and the perseverance, then you will take that flight and get that Airbnb. But that is a very, very highly, rec a highly recommended way to get in touch with the right person. Definitely do your research beforehand. Search the Botanica, search the owner of the Botanica, look at photos, do your research, right? Just don't blindly go fly across America and you don't even know the person you're meeting or the business, right? Do the research, and if you feel comfortable, take your time. Listen. I'll tell you, when you listen more and talk less and move slow, you see things that you normally do not see. And you'll hear things you normally do not hear. Your spirit guides, your egun, your ancestors, I told, that's why I told you, you need to honor them. They will send messages to you. You'll get validation right? Alutamare, you know, you'll get signs, right? But take that trip and nothing, it's you, you know, it's not a waste of money because at the end of the day, you're in front of now a Babaleao and Ayanifa. You're around other Olorishas. You're around the other Epithebis. You're seeing it. You get to feel it. And you heard that ding ding? That's right. You get to see how you feel. Because that would be an ile, right? That would be a spiritual house. And if you feel right with these people, then maybe you should move forward. So I highly suggest to do that. And if it's absolutely something you cannot do, YouTube. There are babaleos on YouTube as well. Number two, do set up an ancestor altar. A bovida. Honor your egun, your spirit guides. And when I mean honor them, do not always be asking them for something. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give no. Pray for them. Ask for their clarity. Ask for their peace. Help them if they have not crossed over. Pray that they are crossed over and happy and thriving. Thank them for the good that they've done. Forgive them for any trans trespasses, any trespasses they may have committed, right? That is honoring your egun. I do have a class in my spiritual shop on actually setting up your altar, your hygiene of your altar, what to have on it, what not to have on it. I do have a class on that and I will put a link in the description below. Number three in my dues, take your time. Move like molasses because at the end of the day when you are going through ceremony and you are initiating, you are putting your livelihood in someone else's hands right? Because these ceremonies, you're tapping into some serious, potent energy. 
And I kid you not, I have seen people get spiritually messed up because they went to someone and they did not initiate them. They did something completely different. And there are two people that I know that I've talked to that they are not the same. And it's unfortunate. However, this is why you want to go to the right person. This is why you want to take your time. This is why you want to do your research. Because and this, this goes for anything. In any faith, any practice, there's going to be people doing it for the good of it. There's people who love Ifa, who wants to teach the beauty of it, who wants to learn. They're passionate about the religion. And then there's other people who see it as a money-making opportunity. So they may cut corners and not do the right protocols. And this ceremony, it is so detailed and intricate. When you take the steps and you go through it, you'll understand exactly what I'm talking about. Why you cannot cut corners. I cannot even imagine like the, mis the mispronunciation of something. I have chills. Whew, I could not imagine that, like what that can do to you. And I've seen it in two different individuals where their life is messed up. And I, <laughs> because of that, I had to remind myself I don't want to be that way because I'm serious about this religion. I finally feel whole. I feel like I have a straight line now to my purpose, to my destiny. I'm no longer have on those blinders. My rose-colored glasses are off and I'm seeing everything for what it is. And I'm seeing myself in a whole new light that I could not imagine if I just rushed and just went to someone. They, they, they did it, bada bing, bada bong, done. That's not good. That's not good at all. So take your time, right? And as I said in my other video, if you pay for your initiation ceremony and you have to wait a few months until that happens, that's good. That's what you want. Because if you're, if you're Ile, if the, if the, the Babalea was doing, <laughs> doing initiations every Thursday, that's not good. Because it takes so much time and energy if people are just initiating like that. That doesn't make sense to me. Are you really doing the whole process? Because at the end of it, I was tired. I was rejuvenated. I felt accomplished. I was happy. But I was tired. I slept for about three days because there's a lot I had to be up for and just focused. And I wanted to take everything in. Like, I was soaking up everything that was being said, being done, being touched. Like, huh. And that pulls a lot of energy. And when they pull you down from heaven, that that's it's tiresome. So, yeah. Take your time. Number four is for my ladies. All right. All right, all right, all right. Weaves. Hair extensions, wigs, I highly, highly suggest that prior to your initiation, or even if you're really trying to go through on a, an authentic spiritual journey, get rid of it. There's nothing like your own crown, and I'm not saying this because I'm rocking my natural hair. I'm saying this as a woman who wore weave for about 12 years. I've worn weave, I've done wigs, I've done uh, like sew-in things, I've done cold fusion, I've done every hairstyle where I added hair, right? And I loved my different hairstyles. My, my fro was big, my hair was used to be long and straight, I loved it. However, at the end of the day, you are trapping your crown. You have a lot of ashe here. This is a lot of energy, right? And that's why you see a lot of spiritual people cover their head. Because that's energy, right? And remember, when you're going through this ceremony, you're ori, right? Your head is marked. You want that to be open. You want that to be free, right? And when you're having, when you have weave or wig, if it's another person's hair, that is horrible because that's their energy. And if you're spiritual, you know hair is powerful. Someone gets hold of your hair, that's not good. <laughs> in, in my culture, we either burn it or we flush it down the toilet. But even flushing down the toilet, you got to be careful because animals. But hair is potent, right? So definitely, if you cannot get rid of your wigs or your weave, make sure it is synthetic and not human hair. And then take your time. But I'm telling you, when you go down an authentic journey, you're going to want to rock your own crown. And I came from that. I, two years ago, you would not see this. No, 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 no. Chantel would get her hair done. 
If she takes it out, the next day it was washed and I was getting it done again. My natural hair would not be out. And now I'm proud to have my crown out. I'm taking care of it. And yes. And I felt I actually had braids in for about five months because I was trying to grow out my edges. And three days prior to my ceremonies, my granny was like, Chantal, take out your hair. And I was like, oh my god, you shouldn't see me. Just trying to take it out, take all my hair out. And if you look at my initiation video, my journey into Lukumi initiation video, you'll see, like, I have my hair out. <laughs> Number five. This is a biggie. All right. When you initiate, or you're in the steps of being initiated, you want to get rid of baggage that you don't need. You want to step into this rank, into this role, into this religion as light as possible. And by that I mean your circle, your, your, your blood, your associates. You need to remove people who do not have your best interests at heart, who are weighing you down, who just are not good for you. You need to remove these people. Because after the ceremony, you're going to be in such high spirits. You're going to feel cleansed, rejuvenated, and just on the right path. You don't want people pulling you back. So you need to take the steps to clean house. And I'm not saying get rid of everybody, but reanalyze. Go into introspection of who you have in your circle and around you, blood or non-blood, that is actually that is actually lifting you and helping you and of your higher self and not people you have around just because you've known them for 10 years or something. Like, no, that's not healthy, right? And I'm a strong believer in the energy that you're bringing in to initiation is the energy that you're kind of going to keep during the, you know, the rest of your life while you're in the religion, right? So I did a lot of work removing a lot of people. And even the months leading up, I really was careful about people coming in my life. If I did not see them in long term, I let them go. If they showed one side of themselves that I was like, mm, I don't like that, I let them go. I would rather be a lone wolf than a popular sheep. And, you know, that's the way it is. And it, it, it can sometimes be sad and get lonely, but I got two cats and I got an amazing boyfriend. That's all that matters. And last but not least of my dues is find your why. You need to dig deep and find out why you want to be initiated into this religion. Whether it's Lukumi, Isheshe, Santeria, Haitian Voodoo, and so on and so on. Because if you're not doing it from your heart, and you're doing it because you want to get vengeance or you want to do love spells or any surface level reason, it's not going to be good. And Arumila, he will know. So you want to step into this religion, heart overhead. You want to be doing it for the right reason. And I'm telling you as a person who, because I paid for everything and I had that waiting period, I really, really thought, okay, is this what I want to do? Because I'm always looking for validation. I'm always questioning. I can sometimes overthink, but I really wanted to know why. And I knew, you know, for me personally, one, I felt that it was bringing me closer to my grandmother because she passed, and unfortunately I was not there in the you know, in the time approaching to her passing away and she passed in her sleep. And I held so much guilt. I held guilt for maybe five years after her passing that I became mentally disturbed, right? Because no one else in my family really gets me. However, I felt like she got me. She got me. And we had this spiritual bond, not even this physical bond. We had a spiritual bond, and then she left. And she was teaching me all this stuff about the religion. And I didn't even know what she was teaching me. She would label it other things. So 
when the closer I got to figuring out what it was she was teaching me and I realized oh snap it's it's an African traditional religion she just kept it secret I felt just comfort like all right grandma what you did wasn't in vain look at me it's Shanti I'm here I'm doing it you see and that's how I felt oh The second thing, I've always been a spiritual person. I love believing in something greater than myself. And, you know, as free spirit as I am, I do like structure. I do like adhering to regulations and rules, especially if it's going to set me up for success and take me to my destiny, to my fullest potential, to where I'm meant to be. So I do not mind these taboos. And there's a couple taboos in religion. It's not like it's saying, oh, I can't get tattoos. Or if I curse, I'm going to be doomed and damned. And if I, you know, it's not like that. There's not, it's not, it's very different from Christianity. Because Christianity says I can't read tarot. I can't look at astrology. I can't watch anything witch related. Like, it's just a whole rule book of all the things that you do that would make you a sinner and you'd go to hell. It's a long list, <laughs> and I probably check everything off on that list. Whereas in Lukumi, we're given a few taboos that we need to adhere to. We are told that, you know, we have to follow the principles of Ifa, and we have to have good character, right? And I follow that, and I just feel that I'm being the best version of myself, and I'm learning something that my ancestors cherished and loved so much. So I feel that my ancestors are like, yes, finally, like, I'm putting them, I'm putting our lineage back on the path. So now my great-great-granddaughter, you know, I hope she's going to be a priestess, right? And she's going to talk about me one day on YouTube. Oh, like, that's what I hope. Like, I want to pass this religion down in my family. I feel connected. I feel powerful. I feel like I am taking my power back from the Western world that stripped it. And you know what? Everything my ancestors went through, it was not in vain because I'm here talking to you guys about this religion. And I hope that this video touches one heart or one soul and someone's like, you know what? Yes, I'm going to do it. I know I can do this because if she did it, alone, I did not have much guidance, you can do it. And I'm here to help any way I can as long as I do not touch on my taboos and I can teach from my level of expertise. And my padrino, he also has a YouTube and that's someone who's even more experienced than me. So that was my why and you need to find yours. So Thank you guys for tuning in today. I'm going to drop some links below in the description. You guys can definitely check out my journey into Lukumi. I have a video on that. Um, I will drop a link to my Padrino's YouTube so you can check out his YouTube. He does talk a lot about the Patakis, the legends of the Orishas. And I will see you guys later. Ashe. <laughs>